in 1955, police four guys did a pipe for funding for this workshop. Asked for $7,500 to have this two month workshop and discuss this interesting, stimulating, and exciting idea. And uh, actually, AI has gone through a long way. And uh, you can see AI is not that brilliant at the beginning. It can only do some basic uh, logic operation. But over the years, there are and the good age and dark age because at one point people have a high interest all the funds institute government and but then people find it can't solve the problem and then no funding so very few people survive for example and uh, jeffrey hinton and uh, have been in the field from old time to now and uh, so make this uh, and uh, revolution in deep learning so in in a simple word, AI just uses machine learning to mimic human intelligence, try to solve all sorts of problems or real applications. And uh, to me, AI is inclusive. And uh, for example, it can use all sorts of uh, bits from uh, different disciplines, statistics or physics or whatever, yeah, to make it uh, work better. And uh, in terms of uh, the big and uh, the transformation, it rely on big data, better algorithm, and uh, also and the powerful GPU. And uh, so here, the people most uh, talk about deep learning. And uh, so compared to traditional neural networks, so the most uh, distinct feature is that we no longer have to identify features to make the model do the prediction. So we can, for example, throw in the whole image and make the make the decision. And in terms of diagnosis or prognosis. So and uh, all the uh, the feature selection and the model and the diagnostic model are trained in end to end mode. And uh, so like this animation, so we need data, but we need the clean data. <coughs> That's the most important thing for machine learning. And uh, so in terms of uh, deep learning and uh, it, this image net uh, has uh, created uh, all the momentum and uh, that's computation in a conference called CVPI, as you know, and uh, so people completed their performance in classification of this data set. You see, before deep learning and the uh, error is about 25%, all of a sudden in 2012, deep learning reduced the error almost by 10%. That's a big achievement. Then afterwards, and the people start using and developing different models, more layers, for example, and the more complicated models to further reduce the errors. And so now it's much and better than human performance. So this is really exciting. On the other hand, and the various governments on the power of AI or potential AI, for example, this UK government has made uh, <coughs> and, uh, many and uh, policy paperwork and uh, in terms of uh, how AI can revolutionize healthcare. And uh, so basically there are many different things AI can do. For example, keep us healthy, early detection, prediction, so on and so forth. And also robotics or end of life care. And so for the past uh, 15 years or so, I have focused on eye diseases. So this is front view of the human eye. And, uh, and uh, so human eye is about 2.5 millimeter, uh, centimeter. So it's quite a small organ, but uh, and, uh, it's very complicated, sophisticated. And uh, over 70% of our sensory input are from this small organ. And uh, so the, on the right hand side is uh, cross-section view of the eye. You see light comes through from the cornea lens to the retina and all these structures are very delicate. So we talk about, uh, for example, the retina 250 micrometer. Any damage to this will cause problem for the cornea. And uh, so there are many interesting applications that we can apply to. And in terms of deep learning, my group has uh, published one of the first papers on how to use deep learning for diagnosis of a DR, and uh, so this is a uh, very early work. And uh, I won't just talk too much on this, and although 
And uh, so one of the collaborators, Gabriela, here, and we have been working on this. And we have made uh, some breakthrough and a new spin, a university spin out. And uh, so that's the boring stuff. And uh, so it's just a diagnosis. Yeah, give you a minute. So I'm going to talk about segmentation. So first of all, and uh, I use this as an example to show how AI can solve the segmentation problems. So on the left is uh, and uh, uh, founder's image is the back body eye of the retina. You can see and uh, there are two structures. We have interest is the cup in the middle and uh, of the disc is the neural retinal ring. These are the key structure we want to segment from this image because for a long time people believe this is relevant to the diagnosis of a glaucoma which is a chronic disease and once you have this you cannot reverse your vision back. So in 2018 published the paper is quite standard stuff and you use a reconstruct a deep a dense network and so to do the segmentation of these two structures uh, in one go. And uh, so at that time, and uh, we tested on and, uh, five different uh, data sets. You can see we, and the most time and the average are <coughs> quite well. The green is the annotation by human experts and blue are uh, and, uh, detections. But the image is not always as good as this public data set. There are challenges, and one well, of my PhD students have looked at this issue and more closely. And uh, so, this in 2020 we proposed a method based on graph neural network. So, we keep <coughs> this segmentation as detect boundary detection because you can, if we can detect the boundary, then we can know the region inside. And uh, so, re we represent the boundary with uh, a number of vertices, for example, for the if uh, this structure is the 360 triangles, we can make it with the 361 vertices in the middle. And if we have a two concentric circles boundaries, we can have a two and uh, these circles uh, represented by vertices. And the, the, the normal stuff here is uh, you can see uh, on the left hand side is a uh, standard uh, convolutional neural network. And the on the right hand side is a uh, uh, graph uh, convolution a neural network. And the reason why I want to combine GCN with CN is that GCN has a better and uh, spatial recognition ability, so hopefully we can get uh, uh, better uh, results. And the uh, link to them is uh, the attention refinement model. So you can see we combine features at different levels. And uh, so we have tried this on two public data sets. And one is uh, and, uh, a challenge data on Vito, and the other is uh, again of the disk. And we have uh, again the good results in terms of uh, optic disk and uh, relative uh, good results on optic cup. And uh, so, follow that, actually, we have made more improvement. So again, still the uh, GCN based. And so now we have uh, <coughs> two auxiliary tasks. One is to check the boundary. And the other is to look at the region. And because boundary and uh, this region are kind of uh, duality, yeah, if one knows boundary, and then we can infer region. Once we know region, we can also look at the boundary. So this is a framework we introduced, and uh, this has uh, introduced uh, better results. And uh, so based on that, and uh, actually, and we tried on, um, again, OCOD, and also look at uh, uh, polyp images, and uh, which is relevant to colon cancer. And uh, so from that, actually, we made some further improvement. So we introduced uh, consistency between boundary and uh, uh, region. Because in our previous work, we look at them separate as uh, auxiliary task. So here, we also combine this consistency, and uh, which is important to move these two results as close as possible. And uh, that's the idea. And uh, so in our recent work, and uh, so we introduced uh, weekly semi supervised 
and the strategy into segmentation. Because the reason for that is that uh, and uh, we have access to uh, uh, UK by Bank, which is a large data set, and up to 100,000 people's uh, founders images. And uh, unfortunately, experts only measure the ratio what better is the, uh, the ratio between the cup and the disk in what to do direction. There's no segmentation on the boundaries. So in order to use this data to improve the segmentation, we introduced uh, and, uh, three branches. And uh, so this is a, a weekly supervised uh, model that the, uh, the model can predict the CDR. And also in a semi-supervised way, and uh, we want to look at uh, this and uh, this two and boundary and the region when you can buy bank there is no ground truth or segmentation and uh, so for the other public data we have uh, all this information that will be fully supervised so this framework actually have gained uh, and uh, best results so far we are quite confident that this is a kind of uh, state of the art in terms of ODOC segmentation. And uh, so these are some uh, examples you can see uh, from the original image of uh, other messages from truth and ours. And uh, so I'm going to move away from the right to the front of the cornea because we're here and uh, we look at uh, and the neuropathy, which is a complication of diabetes. And uh, almost uh, most people will get this problem. And uh, one new way to look at that is to uh, use uh, a local <coughs> microscope to look at the uh, cardio nerves in the front. There are some uh, peripheral uh, nerves are very thin. They are in the micrometer level. And uh, where is the talk about uh, on the 50 micrometers. So you can see they are different. This is the uh, cardio nerves of uh, healthy people and these are the uh, people and, uh, with the diabetic neuropathy. And uh, so we look at the two aspects so far. One is uh, about to use AI to do segmentation. So we can use a, a, a unit and uh, to segment uh, all these cardio nerves and uh, with uh, great and, uh, accuracy. And uh, actually for this work, and uh, in the review process, one of the reviewers asked uh, and uh, can commission if we can show them some failed cases. Unfortunately, we don't have any failed cases. We just uh, show the more results in the supplementary. And uh, so this is an interesting aspect uh, in terms of uh, segmentation. And uh, more recently, we are working with uh, clinicians at Royal, and uh, we look at uh, using Confocal nerve images to make the diagnosis of uh, the, uh, diabetic neuropathy. So, and uh, so this has been published uh, this year. So it's uh, uh, featured as a front cover of uh, this uh, journal. And uh, from here, you see on the left is uh, the original image. And uh, so the right two columns are the silicon maps or heat maps to illustrate. Where a, uh, which regions they have uh, looked at and to make the, the diagnosis. And uh, so these uh, are the segmentation diagnosis. And uh, so we also look at uh, and uh, other AI techniques such as uh, multiple instance learning or histology and uh, whole slide image classification. So uh, you may know, and uh, histology uh, data is a very large in dimension. So we talk about uh, um, gig and uh, ten thousands or hundred thousand uh, uh, by hundred thousand pixels per slide. So each and uh, the two five six two five six is just just a small dot if you look at uh, the low magnification. So, but uh, the data compared to other applications are very small. And these are the problems. So when we look at uh, multiple instance learning problem, and uh, you can see uh, we have some uh, artificial bags. And so in a bag, if there is uh, any positive instance, and then that bag will be labeled as positive, and uh, otherwise it's negative. 
So most time for this multiple instance learning, we only have the label of uh, the bag, not the instance. And uh, this is the challenge problem. And uh, we want to train a multiple instance learning to infer uh, if an unknown bag is positive or uh, negative. But fundamentally, in the future, we also wish to know the label of each instance from the lab, from the label of the slide. And uh, so this is uh, and uh, how we uh, apply this uh, multiple instance learning to and uh, pathology uh, slide to make a, a diagnosis. And uh, so there are some uh, challenges and uh, the number of uh, host slide image is very small, we talk about 100. On the other hand, there are lots of lots of uh, instances in, or uh, small patches in a slide. And also, and uh, it's uh, unbalanced. Even in this slide, uh, the tumors are very small compared to non-tumor regions. So we need uh, some more clever thought to address this problem. And uh, but another student, Henry uh, Zhang, has uh, Develop this uh, double tier feature distillation and the framework. So the idea is, uh, and uh, with this double uh, structure, and uh, we can increase the number of uh, bags, pseudo bags. We call it pseudo bags. So we group uh, and uh, a small group of patches in one from one slide as a pseudo bag, and then we learn the features from them. And uh, so this created number and uh, more number of bags. So we can learn, hopefully we can learn better features from this process. And, uh, and then after that, uh, and we have another layer of multiple incidents, we call it tier two. So we can uh, aggregate the features again to make the final and uh, prediction. So this is, uh, so we have applied this to Two big data set, and also in this framework, and uh, how we include it here, and uh, we have uh, look at uh, how to and uh, uh, visualize the probability of uh, patches, and uh, so compared to uh, traditional attention, you can see, and uh, in, in the past people use attention score and uh, to visualize uh, the regions that make the classification. So our normal probability and uh, the framework can uh, highlight uh, and better the regions. And uh, so in terms of uh, classification performance, and uh, again, and uh, we apply this to this method to two public data set, and uh, we achieved and uh, very good uh, results. And uh, in terms of uh, the model complexity, and uh, it's uh, comparable to other models. It's uh, no, not uh, and, uh, worse than the other. For example, it's about uh, 80 million flops, and, but others is about uh, similar. So this is uh, and, uh, what we have uh, um, published this year. And in the next few minutes, so I talk about diagnosis, segmentation. And uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit on and the prognostic model because personally I believe this is a very important area to look at because in our healthcare system normally we follow patients for many years and for example in this study and the patient have been followed for at five six years some patients have been followed 12 years and we want to see when the patient develop a condition here for example and uh, in down the line, in five years, if the patient will develop a condition called aging-related macular degeneration. And uh, so from a uh, uh, modern point of view, this is a uh, longitudinal data. So at each time point, we have uh, color founders. And on top of that, there are some other clinical uh, data uh, available as well. So it's uh, how to learn features from this data and also and if you look at this example actually the follow up the intervals may be uneven so some some patient will follow the interval is six months 
them on one year. And how do you take, uh, take this kind of uh, uneven time intervals into the modeling? And uh, so we look at this issue. And the traditionally, there are two ways. One way is uh, the most of the recent work in prognostic models is you use a single image, just uh, and the most uh, and uh, recent time point, and uh, to extract features. Let's say using deep learning to extract feature and then predict <coughs> if the patient will develop a uh, condition or not. And it is through a way for the past data. So this is not good in terms of uh, and the prediction because uh, we have the valuable about data and you cannot take it into account. And uh, on the other hand, uh, tradition in a traditional way, I can extract features. I say I use uh, if the expert told me I can detect the uh, retinal vessels or drusens or whatever features. I extract those features and then I can have feature vectors. I can put in a statistical model, and uh, because there are lots of uh, statistical models available, and uh, as Gabriela has shown me in the, all the years, and they can tackle this problem. But uh, the challenge <coughs> here is, and uh, we don't know the features. What are the best? What the best features are, and uh, so we are stuck. And also for many statistical models, and uh, when the Number of features become a very large, uh, that will become a, a problem. So, we have proposed this and uh, deep learning model to take into consideration of uh, images. And uh, in this model, you can see for each time point, we have uh, a convolutional neural network to extract features from that image. And uh, having said that, all these convolutional neural network share weights. And uh, so, in order to reduce the number of parameters, and in a way, they can learn feature from the images. And uh, on the other hand, and uh, we have this uh, window function. This is a very basic window function. Basically, it's uh, just the inverse and uh, interval uh, from the and uh, um, the time of visit, for example, t zero, and uh, the and the future at the time when we want to make the prediction. And uh, so this is a way to give more weight and uh, to more recent uh, uh, data of recent visit. That makes sense to me. And uh, we call it uh, carry more feature information for the diagnosis. And then afterwards, we have uh, another and uh, uh, data recurrence unit to make the prediction. And uh, so this is a very basic model. And uh, here I'll show you some uh, and, uh, results. And uh, so here, this is a standard ROC curve. And uh, we show three uh, different curves and uh, cross, um, account, corresponding to three different uh, scenarios. And one is to use a single time point and uh, the most recent time point, or I use a two time point, or I use a three time points. So you can see. With an increased number of time points, as uh, AUC has been and uh, largely uh, improved, and uh, so and uh, all these and uh, the numbers in the bracket are confidence intervals, and uh, so uh, using different techniques. And on the right hand side, and I showed this, uh, we showed some uh, uh, the heat maps. And uh, the top row is uh, other original images of uh, the his, uh, uh, an eye. And the second row, you can see the heat maps and uh, over the time. And having said that, and both of uh, these two eyes have uh, progressed to wet AMD, unfortunately. And uh, so in terms of uh, uh, AI, and uh, for my group, we also try to bridge and the AI with the traditional mathematical image analysis. So this uh, is the only formula and uh, I have included in the slide. And this is a classic uh, active control without edge model and uh, very famous and uh, very robust lamentation. But uh, for many uh, of you as a mathematician, you can, oh, I like this formula, I need to, to solve the PDE. 
yeah, in order to get uh, and this uh, C1 and uh, C2 and also this uh, uh, U. But it's iterative and uh, take time. So what we thought is that uh, so we can reuse this energy function as a loss function. This can be used to measure the sedimentation to train an AI model. This is the idea we have used, and you can see this is the concept. We have the heart, and we can use the formula to measure the length area, and so make the and uh, sedimentation. And uh, you can see, and here we showed the uh, and the uh, effect of uh, this new loss function. We can call it active control loss, and uh, so it shows you can segment uh, uh, this left right ventricle and the myocardium very well. And uh, having said that, I have to give some credit to Gabriel, who is in the audience, who is also the co-author and also co-supervisor for this student. And uh, so here are the results <coughs> compared to previous work. And uh, in terms of uh, performance, we have gained much better performance in terms of dice and hospital for distance of uh, these three different uh, structures. So, because uh, uh, the level phase, many of you may be involved in uh, Liverpool cardiovascular and uh, center, which is a joint effort between Liverpool University and John Morris. So, I've been involved in many projects with uh, cardiovascular diseases. One problem is uh, this, and uh, ECG. And uh, so you may be familiar with this ECG wave. It's very clear. In this, you can see different waves. And uh, so this ECG can be used to tell if a patient is normal or abnormal. And uh, unfortunately, so our healthcare has a, a very uh, different view to use the data. So these are electric signals instead of uh, keep the record digitally. And uh, most hospitals print it in A4 paper or on a piece of paper. And then afterwards, we have, uh, if we look at this data, it's uh, all print. We have to scan all this paper record back to the picture. That's how millions of records are in paper. So only recently, and uh, there are and the ECG signal in PDF. So the question proposed uh, to us is: Can we train an AI model and to make a prediction from this kind of data? So certainly, if you look at the image analysis, okay, I can try to interact all these waves, and which is a challenging problem itself. And uh, on the other hand, my students look at and uh, apply AI to this data directly. We treat this image uh, as an input, and uh, with deep learning, we can learn features and uh, can make a diagnosis. So we have uh, uh, this and our smaller data set from uh, collaborators in China, and uh, so we have uh, and uh, some preliminary work, they showed us a AI can make a good uh, and uh, prediction. And having said that, and the blue point, and actually shows the performance of expert. If the expert are show this picture, and uh, they make the diagnosis if it's normal or normal. So, and uh, they are still in the and uh, confidence interval, and uh, also you can see, and uh, they have, and uh, although they are both uh, higher specificity, and uh, but uh, and uh, if the sense, uh, they have a higher sensitivity, but specificity is comparatively lower than AI. And however, and uh, at this stage, I cannot promise you an AI will work on all the paper records. Uh, because it's a really small data set, and uh, we are uh, working with others to get more data from different centers. Hopefully, we can verify the idea further. And uh, so, in the last uh, 
uh, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, uh, talk about a uh, little bit uh, and the uh, big uh, challenges of AI. And uh, so I borrowed this paper to make the point. You see, three years ago when the when COVID-19 uh, broke out, and uh, so it's a pandemic. So many people uh, look at the AI because the AI has shown very powerful in many applications. So, so people believe AI can be used to make a diagnosis from uh, either CT or X-rays. Unfortunately, in, and uh, lots of effort or uh, money have spent on this particular pro uh, aspects. In 2000 alone, there are over 2000 papers. And uh, so the group from Cambridge show have done a literature review, a systematic review of all the work. The conclusion is alarming. You see, none of them are of a potential clinical use because the methodological flaws or biases, and none of them are robust and reproducible. That's a problem, you see. So, so AI, doing, AI is not a frame, you see. You have to collect so many data and run the models. And uh, so this year, when I went to a conference, people talk, try to simulate uh, how much uh, carbon footprint <laughs> with people and uh, try to make this kind of work. So, and, uh, so they estimate uh, and for a conference uh, and uh, they spend, uh, they cost, uh, they, they cost the carbon footprint uh, for six people for the whole year to train AI models. That's quite a lot of uh, effort. <coughs> and also, you see, we look at this problem. Yeah, AI yeah, has done a good job to recognize people. But it's, the problem is that women is not crossing the road when the red light is on. It's on his foot is on the bus. He was caught you and she is uh, far away. <laughs> so this is a kind of a privacy. Also, Tesla is always on the news, and uh, so I don't have any comments on this. And you can see the numbers and accident and us without autopilot and hours of uh, and uh, with autopilot. And but the AI at the moment is itself is for many people is not trustworthy because they don't know how it works. That these are the problem. And people think about the safety. So we talk about at computer safety, we talk about AI more on the bright side, and it can better our life and uh, in many ways. But there are also ways and, uh, that can make harm to our human. And sometimes it's uh, deliberately if we can use AI as weapons. Or some are just uh, because uh, and uh, we are bounded by our knowledge. And, and also, and there are many, many factors. So it's a, a big problem, AI safety. And uh, so there are many ways. And for example, the safety comes from all these issues, non-robustness. And uh, most time, we have AI model work perfect on one data. If you apply to the other data, performance sometime in the zero. That's uh, really, that really happened. <laughs> in our research, we have look at, we have seen this. And also the bias. There are so many different biases that can cause problem. And for many and the people like the clinicians, they care about the explainability. Most of them, they criticize the AI as black box and because they don't know what or how the AI has made decision. For based on that, many people still don't trust the AI, although people have interest. And also and the privacy and the how we can and avoid this privacy violation. And uh, so in terms of uh, application of AI, also there is accountability. <coughs> so who's the responsibility? And if uh, I deploy an AI and diagnosis to in clinic if we make a wrong decision, whose fault? Developers? 
tester or the clinician who use it. The, this is, there are still so, so many questions. So I like this picture to summarize all the aspects of uh, and uh, how we develop ethical machine learning. And uh, you look at uh, and uh, there are this is like an iceberg. You can most for most of us we see some and uh, challenges. It's easier to see in balance or skewed data set. But on the water there are more challenges. We haven't all dealt with and uh, well, for example, and uh, bias, and uh, so regulations, and uh, label bias, component bias, and uh, or fundamentally, and in our healthcare system, there is a health, healthy equity, and uh, there are many, many and uh, ways that can uh, affect of AI. So in many ways, <coughs> and uh, so. We order AI to real work for real applications, and we need to think carefully. And uh, the whole life cycle. And uh, personally, I believe, and uh, this should be the and uh, life cycle of AI instead of just a linear. And uh, even for many researchers and uh, uh, people have. Uh, only look at the life cycle, but uh, not to uh, think has a chance to look at the deployment. Yeah, for many researchers <coughs> in edu higher education, for example, we have a problem from clinicians. <coughs> Clinician create some data and we train AI and get some results. Oh, AI work perfect, but we never thought about how to deploy it, what problem will be. And uh, so this is a yeah, real academic uh, and uh, exercise. On the other hand, if we want AI work, I believe, and uh, so for all the people who work in AI should uh, think about all these uh, uh, elements in every detail. First of all, and uh, we need to define the problem precisely before we do everything, anything. And then with the problem defined, we collect data, and which is uh, fit, fit for purpose. And then we do training, validation, and then we deployment. And after deployment, actually, there is a huge task to monitor the performance, to quantify the drift and of performance. And then we have to go back and uh, to refine the AI model. So it's a close circle to me. And uh, in essence, I think so. For example, when we design this as specification. So first of all, we should understand what problem to be addressed. Yeah, so most people, you should think about it. You want to diagnose one disease or multiple diseases in your model. This is a very uh, different uh, question. And uh, you can't uh, collect data from one problem <coughs> for the other problems you haven't designed for. Most time it won't work. And then it's about the population to be applied. And uh, so there are different uh, ethnicities and also age group and prevalence may be different. So, and also what types of data to be used? All this should be in the design. And uh, so what, how about the, the devices you use, acquisition or missing data, how this, all of this should be taken into account in the design phase. And uh, also you should think about test and uh, how to measure the performance, and uh, speed, accuracy, explainability, all these performance metrics should be considered before we do the work. And also you have to think about how to mitigate the risk, and if this fails, what to do, for example. And uh, so in terms of bias, here is an example. So if let's say, this is a simple task, yeah? On the top row is the cat. A dog and both, and then we try to prefer AI to predict if a picture is a cat or a dog. And uh, so, if I show you an example, so if I give you this image, do you think AI will predict this as a cat or a dog? So, it depends on what feature AI has learned. If AI has picked up the features of 
cats, for example, the pointy ears, it will make the correct prediction. But if a land feature, let's say a not real feature, it is a color, then it will be totally wrong. This will be dark because it's black. <coughs> Likewise, sometimes for the dog, right? It depends on what features. If the background is used, then all the prediction will be wrong. Yeah, because they deliberately choose dogs in the garden, not in the home. So this is so we have to avoid biased data. And on the other hand, for many medical applications, and people also look at uh, and uh, rely on the ground truth, that is a diagnosis. Yeah, do we trust the diagnosis or not? So here I'll show you an example. Yeah, if we ask five different experts to trace the boundary of uh, this optic cup, of the disc and cup, you can see they are different. So the problem is, the challenge is how we can teach our AI model to learn from this diversity. Yeah, they are not consistent, but we want the AI perform consistent. And also the training, and uh, so personally, I believe that we should, if we can choose a small model to make the make it, uh, the application rather than a big model, because uh, and uh, <coughs> this outcome is the razor, and also we rely on many techniques, transfer learning, data augmentation, dropout, and visualization to guide us the training. And uh, so, as our uh, lessons learned, when we train a model, we should always look at and how AI works, for example, based on the heat maps or other future CDC maps to understand if AI has learned the real features. And uh, uh, struck by this kind of heat maps in our uh, COVID work, because we have done uh, COVID diagnosis as well as others. And we train a model on a bit 100% accurate. We will apply to a different set, 0%. So it classify everything to one class. So we look at uh, features. Oh, you see, this class, the COVID should be problem in the lungs, but it look at somewhere else. And because the data is biased, and the AI just learned, so manufacturers and bed are different. <coughs> or the clothes outside the body. So that's the reason. So based on this knowledge, actually afterwards, and uh, we further refined our model. So we segment the lungs first. And so get rid of all the confounders. And based on that, we train and models to improve the performance. And uh, so and as a result, and uh, we have uh, our recent work have uh, get a very good performance and uh, we trusted the performance and uh, so it's uh, and uh, we submitted to a journal it will be appear soon. And also testing. This is also important. Most time we complain the data is too small without uh, enough uh, testing data. And uh, so I think uh, my point is uh, even and uh, we need to testing properly, not only our own data, but also external data, a different uh, population or a population you want to apply to test the performance. And that's the reason, and in this process, we should follow and uh, reporting standard. And uh, so to make sure and everything is uh, properly. And uh, so monitoring is also important and uh, so given the time, and I want to go in detail. So, and because as we know, and uh, so uh, data can drift, or population are different, or devices or disease prevalence or change, and the model should be refined. And also, and how to measure this data drift? And uh, these are the big questions. And uh, we have to look at uh, in my group, and hopefully, People here can have more knowledge on this. And uh, so also, and uh, AI is not uh, ad hoc work, and I'm hoping, and uh, including us, everyone can follow the standards, even for <coughs> medical applications. 
and all this reporting and the standards and also if you want to make your work as a product, you have to follow quality management system and also approval, regulation approvals. Those are the most important things. And before I finish, <coughs> and uh, I just warn you, and optimization, optimism is the greatest enemy to all. And this not only happened now, but for our pioneers, we see in 1950s, 60s, what they have said, within generations of artificial will substantially be solved. Have we done that? Personally, I don't believe it. And uh, so I use this diagram to show, and this is where are we heading to? It's another winter of bright future. I hope we are on the uphill side, and uh, with everyone's effort, we can really make benefit to our human mind. And so, in short summary, AI has huge potential in healthcare applications. And unfortunately, we have only can create a small part of the problem, and this will rely on and uh, collaborate work between us, clinicians, and also end users. We should make this happen by following us and clinical or regulatory guidelines and all sorts of standards. And finally, I wish to thank all my group members who developed these fantastic uh, um, programs. And uh, possibly in the future, I should include photos of uh, my clinical collaborators as well. And uh, thank you for listening. And uh, other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, Yalin, for this great talk. <clears throat> if you want to ask questions, if you are in Teams, then try to unmute yourself. And um, if that doesn't work, then try to ask the question in the chat. I will keep an eye on that. So you would like to ask the first question. Yes, um, thank you, Professor John, for your wonderful uh, talk. I got two general talks, actually. Yes, yeah, the first one is, uh, I, I remember you mentioned that you, uh, the uh, ECG slides. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so your work uh, was based on the image analysis of those 2D signals. Uh, yeah. yeah. I just wonder why don't you use another uh, the signal, 1D signal rather than two dimension. Uh, okay. Can I answer this question first before a second question? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. The question here is uh, in, uh, in many hospitals, ECG also is uh, 1D waveforms. Uh, because there are 12 leads, we will take uh, 12 uh, records. Yeah, there are 12 uh, waveforms. And as a convention, uh, they print ECG on paper. You, you don't have the waveforms. You, if you want, you have to use the image processing and measure to recover the waveform to do the analysis. That in itself will be a challenge. Yeah, you don't have the waveform. And less recently, and all the ECG manufacturers provide a PDF, and which is a high quality, you can easily to read out. But for billions of for billions of records, they are all paper somewhere. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, my, my second question is because I, I come from the computer graphics background, so I just wonder uh, because I saw uh, almost all of your works are based on 2D analysis yeah so do, do you think if uh, we apply 3d technique uh, where this help your uh, recognition to improve your recognition rates so for example if we do uh, image 3d imaging uh, visual, say visualization say uh, 3d modeling of those eyeballs uh, or those uh, I don't know whatever uh, from those uh, 3d scans uh, where this have uh, and in terms of impress, uh, improving uh, the recognition rates? Yes, the answer is uh, yes. Because uh, for, let's say, uh, for medical applications, actually, uh, there are more, and uh, there are many data in 3D. For example, CT, yeah, uh, or MR images, they are all in 3D. 
And uh, certainly for today's talk, I only talk about 3D. And we have done some work on CT and MRI as well. And uh, on the other hand, we also, I think video is also a big topic. Yeah. For example, and uh, human, yeah, maybe human, every organ, a movie all the time. You take a sequence of uh, images of the heart, for example, you can quantify the change of the volume of the left lung tube, those kind of uh, analysis, yeah. Actually, I think uh, the 3D or graphics or all this can be applied, yeah. Some of novel ideas are from uh, different <coughs> domains. Thank uh, well, thank you very much for uh, this great uh, presentation. Uh, I'll ask two questions. Uh, one question, very general question, and the second one is more of the trust. When can we trust AI to start doing diagnosing for us? When do you think that? Or uh, I know we are using weak AI so far. Do you think we will have in the next five years we can reach that point? And when do we need to reach that point? Uh, depends on the application. For example, and, uh, for screening of the diabetic uh, retinopathy, there are, all, there are already products approved by authorities. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so also on the other hand, so we talk about I talk about high level application <coughs> segmentation for example, diagnosis, and uh, they are more difficult to be accepted by users. On the other hand, for example, for MRI or CT, yeah, the creative images, acquisition, reconstruction, actually many AI have been used already. Yeah, excellent. Okay, um, I'm good. If you can put for us, uh, I think, uh, slide number three. I would like to borrow it, actually. Uh, Okay, this one. before that, before that, before that, sorry, before that, no, after, 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 yeah, that one, no, yeah, that one. Um, one of the questions which is in my mind, I was expecting you to have Alan Tuning somewhere there, Alan Tuning, <laughs> you didn't have Alan Tuning in there, uh, and I was expecting that, because I, I, all the time I say Alan Tuning, he's the father of AI. Yeah. So what do you think about that? I use it in my talk all the time. I say <laughs> AI, AI was created by Alan Tuning because he managed to use yeah. algorithms, yeah, and he managed to change uh, the way we think about computing. Yeah. And this is why we have a tuning machine. But when I look at sorry, the, the one next one. Uh, next this one. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's no Alan Tuning there, no, so it's not the fair, is it? Yeah, <laughs> I think yeah. I think people they are not given enough talk about Alan Tuning. But when I look at him, some of his books, I mean, okay, he he used it intelligent. He call, he didn't call it AI, but he called it machine can think. Yeah. Yeah. But still AI. Yeah. Sorry, that's just me. Yes, that's it. Yes, that's a fair comment. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so next time we should have it somewhere. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to take this one and modify it and put Alan Tunic somewhere. <laughs> and I blame you on that. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. So I think we probably have to stop here because Yalin uh, said that he has to leave at 2 p.m. sharp. And I think he hasn't mm -hmm. even given us some extra minutes. So please, uh, let's thank um, Yalin again for his great talk. And um, see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you for the